they are complaining because in Israel they're not writing even the name of the writers, the full name. It's the first letter and the family name. Alef Kohen. And Mishpacha was Elisheva Kohen. So they said one of the, the, they sent us a list of things that we have to change. So they say, you have to, you can't put names of women in your publication. And Rav Eliyashiv looked and said, so he said, understand, these people will change the Tanakh also. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm like thinking. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, ridiculous. They don't, I don't know how they get through Megillah's Esther, you know. Ridiculous. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. And, you know, I've been doing these podcasts, Living L'Chaim, other shows. And when I take a step back, I, I think they're of the responsibility that there is. You know, I'm putting out a lot of content for the Jewish world or the world at large. And, and that comes with a lot of responsibility, um, famously from the amazing Spider-Man, that with great uh, power comes great responsibility. And, and I don't take that lightly, and I definitely don't feel powerful, but it's, you know, I, people here and there stop me and say, hey, I listened or I watched that. And it's like, whoa, the impact is, I really can't really imagine what it's like. But it brings me to my, this week's guest of Ellie Palais. And he is the founder and he, well, not necessarily found, but you'll hear more about it, but he runs Mishpacha magazine and has been doing it since day two or three. You'll, you'll hear the story there. And he, I think he has the strongest voice in Klal Yisrael, which I, you know, the thousands of people every single week uh, reading what's going on in the world through the lens of mishpacha, I, I'd be very scared to do what they're doing, but they're doing an incredible job. And and th- you would think this conversation, this episode, would be about mishpacha magazine, which there's a lot of talk about it, but I, it's more fascinating to me, um, Ellie, and who he is and what he's doing and his deep, deep desire to make an impact on the world. And even after the interview, we're, we spoke for like an extra hour, just about different initiatives that he's working on. And he's a powerhouse of someone who's who's uh, doing so much. So um, uh, shout out to, I won't say his last name, but shout out to Shlomo for uh, hooking this conversation up. And um, this episode is in memory of Shimon David ben Yaakov Shlema, and it's also in memory of Miriam Sarah, Bas Yaakov Moshe, their neshama, Shehav Aliyah. Without further ado, my conversation with Ellie. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Here we are with the one and only Eli Palay. How many people botch up your name? That's my first question. <laughs> Very few people know how to say it right. I'm trying to give them the spelling beforehand. And usually people have many versions about my name. And probably each of them is relevant. Is it more Americans that mess up your no, name? No, no, or no, in it's Israel. Israel. It's in Israel, okay. When I'm going to be interviewing the Israeli radio television, always I'm giving them the English spelling because I don't know how to... Palay, P-A-L-E-Y. And sometimes it works. Many times they're making some versions. Interesting. Pelly, Ply. Paley, right? Paley, yeah, it could be a lot of like stuff. Like a wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, okay, obviously, we're going to talk about Mishpacha Magazine and a, a lot of other things that you're involved in. But I guess, take me back. Where did you grow up? You're, I, I assume you grew up in Israel. Yeah. Where in Israel did you grow up? I was born in Yerushalayim 57 years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, in the neighborhood of Matersdorf, where Rav Scheinberg used to live. Yeah, sure. Um, and our heritage is our family was uh, the founders of the Hebron Yeshiva in the city of Hebron in 1925. So my grandfather and my great grandfather that was a Chavrusa with Rebbe uh, Leibovich came on 1925 to establish the Slobodki Yeshiva in the city of Hebron. So always I'm telling people that our Zionist mission to counter Eretz Israel was to establish a Torah in Eretz Israel. And later, my uh, grandfather uh, became the assistant of Rabbi Herzog, the chief rabbi of Israel. Um, so I grew up in Yerushalayim, in the Hebron family. I learned in Hebron You yeshiva. went to Hebron Yeshiva? I went to Hebron. My son went to Hebron. We oh, are wow. fifth generation in the Hebron uh, wow. 
my Rosh Hashiva went to Hebron, and it's not the same thing. My, my Shiva Rabbi Chaim Tzvi Center. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was like an American boy, and David Klein, It's you probably fit in a little more than... Uh, so did you... I mean, if I look at you, I wouldn't, you don't necessarily look like the typical Hebron Talmud. Does that make sense? Or maybe the, the yeshiva chef did. What do you mean? In, in what sense? Like, you know, when I, see, when I was in Israel, I saw Hebron, uh, you know, Bacher... Yeah, they look like a little more... I'm not a bocher anymore. Right, so maybe I guess that's so. Maybe, maybe confused. Get, I don't know. It's me. I don't know. You're maybe five years not a bocher <laughs> anymore, you know? Um, so, okay. So, you went to Hebron Yeshiva. Did you, did you have this idea to create Meshbacha magazine or did it happen organically? Um, it's a very interesting story. How, what's the connection between Hebron Yeshiva and my love of learning to Meshbacha? So, I was learning in Hebron and uh, my big dream was to continue to sit and learn. When I got married... I wanted to continue to learn in the yeshiva. I knew that I want to sit and learn. I knew that I'm not going. I'm not ready to go to any small koilel, where you know, with cigarettes and coffee. It's it's not for me. Not I love the kind of learning in Hebron yeshiva. So I came to Rav Hevroni. He was a good friend of my father, and I said, "Listen, I want to stay in yeshiva." I said, "But we don't have a koilel. You want to stay? You can stay, but we don't have a koilel. I, I can give you what, whatever I'm getting from the government." So I said, okay, I don't care. We said, but why are you coming to me? Your father is such a big baltzdoke and supports so many yeshivas. He says, no, but I want to be independent. I don't want to be relying on my father. So I decided to stay in yeshiva. And, um, and my wife just started college those years. She went to the Michle line, Beit Vegan. Um, and, uh, and then a few months later, my brother came to me and he said, there is a new publication called Mishpacha. It's a monthly publication. And they are looking for someone to do distribution in Jerusalem. Are you looking for some side job? I said, yes, I would love to. As like a paper boy? Yeah. Wow. I said, yes, I would love to. And I had an old car, Susita. So I was so lucky. Uh, I, I immediately took the job. It took me like a day and a half, once a month, once every five, six weeks, because it didn't come you know, systematically on time. Uh, so once a month, I was going to the printer to pick up the magazines to go to the stores. And then another day, or by the weekend, noontime, I'm going to do collections. And I was earning at that time twice as much as Young Elad got for an entire month in a coil. So that was my first uh, um, like business mm-hmm. uh, to do. And I was so happy that I can be independent. I can learn whenever I want to learn, whatever I want to learn. Um, and uh, and later, I'll get back to this story, but later, two years later, so the publisher, it was a very small publication, a monthly, it was the first colorful publication for Haredi with pictures, oh, with wow. Rabani, with this kind. And you, did you hear of it before your brother approached you? Or, like, was it a known no, it thing? Was, it was really new. It was, like, in the third, the third issue after oh, two wow. months. Oh, okay, literally He started brand to new. work for them, and he said, no, it's not a business, something that it comes, you know, mm-hmm. once a month for a few, few days, it's not a business, but for you as someone who sits and learns a side job, um, and then they offered my father to buy it. He said, well, you know, if my son is working, let me buy it out. It wasn't like a real business. And the rest was history. I was called and it took me some time to understand what I'm doing here because my plan was to sit and learn. I love learning, writing, learning. Which I, I, I want to say before <laughs> that we're, we're doing this interview in someone's home in Manhattan, you were like, for 30 minutes, we didn't start because you were handling and learning with the person that we're doing this interview yeah, by. Yeah. So, so, so I, I definitely it's, see it's, that's it's still, true. It's still my big passion, my big love. So I'm always telling people that my career in Mishpacha started with my big love of uh, Torah learning. Um, So, uh, and I didn't know what I'm doing here, why I'm here. So I said, okay, I came to help my father because he bought a publication. I I have no, I didn't have any background in business. That wasn't my dream, my passion. Um, But once I realized that this is where I am, so first I understood that I have to start to learn this field and to see, okay, what's going to be our unique uh, contribution in, in, in the field of journalism, which we'll speak about it later. But, uh, and secondly, I felt, took me time, but I said, listen, you have some plans, but the Kodesh Baruch Hu have his own plans, and if, took me time to, you know, to digest it and to, <laughs> and, and to uh, Internalize accept it. it. Right. Uh, but then I said, you know, that wasn't my plan, and I was, for a few, at least two years, I was a little bit frustrated 
why I'm here. You know, I wasn't planning. I, I was looking for Parnassa. I did it because, you know, my father came and they asked me to come to help him. Not my father. The guy who sold it to my father hmm. said, are you, you know, maybe you should come try to help. Your father has put some money. And, uh, but then was, I remember the day that I said to myself, listen, you have your own plans, but the Kodesh Brochu, and if Kodesh Brochu put you in this place, so meaning you have some, something that you have to do. And from this day and on, I understood that I am in a mission. And that's what, when I turned from doing something as a Bedi Eved, I have no choice. I was asked, you know, I feel bad for my father. He did something. It wasn't just a good investment at that time. <laughs> um, and I felt that I have a mission. And I think over the years, that was, was my drive in uh, working for Mishpacha. So, so that day when, when you said, okay, Hashem gave me a purpose, a reason, what was your mission then? And, and has it shifted since? Um, I, I want to continue, but please, I want to get sure, back to the go, story yeah, yeah, sure, sure. of working because that has to do with what I'm doing today. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I'll get, back, I'll get back to the question of what, what was the mission. And, um, so, okay. So as I said, I was learning in Koilel. I wanted to learn. I didn't want to be, uh, depend on any government money or I want to be, you know, doing my own. And I was looking for some side job. And I find a side job, which is ideally, even ideally if learning Torah, that you don't, you don't miss Spanish, like the Torah Kardom Lach Porbo. The only problem was that it was illegal. Meaning in Israel in those days, and by the way, it's almost still till today, over the last 70 years, if you want to sit and learn in Koilel, as long as you didn't go to the army, you are not allowed to have any income. Mm. Meaning, not, not you are not allowed to leave the Koilel to go to work. That makes sense. If you want to leave the Koilel, first go to the army. No, you want to stay in Koilel. And you want in your extra hours, okay, by the evening, early morning, vacations, being as money, you want to, you want to do something for living. It was, it, it was and it's still almost today illegal. Because he said, you want to you make a living? Go to the army. Okay, but army is a real issue. Let's, we have to discuss. We have to speak about the army. But why we're putting together these two issues of army and working? So the only way I could do it was to register under my wife's name, because she, it was legal. And so she, like, she was presented like she works for the company, and I was getting the money. And this experience bothers me so much. And I said, and... and this is one of the great examples what happened to the Haredi society in Israel, that something in the system didn't work out and creates like... like um, yeah, mu mutation. Mutation. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so repeat. Yeah. And I said, this is one of the stories that I think led me to think about one of the, the, the complicated situation that Haredi were facing in Israel. Here, here is an example. Haredi guy wants to sit and learn, doesn't want to get money from Gevirim, doesn't want to get money, he wants to, to go to work and to continue to learn, which this is the ideal of Torah learning, and it's illegal. So it's illegal, so you have to cheat, so you have to put your wife, and that creates some kind of uh, uh, illegality, meaning you, you, you start and you grow up in a sense that, okay, I, I have to cheat the system in order to keep my, my values and my Torah lifestyle. And later on, which I'll get back to this, I think that was one of the examples that I felt we need to do something in terms of macro policy, how we can live together Haredim and non-Haredim and, and not paying the price with such uh, uh, wrong policies that will affect our, our lifestyle in, in uh, the state of Israel. Right, that's very interesting. That's very interesting that you, I love that you, you actually, you've, not only did you feel bad about it, but like you, you later on said, okay, how could we actually make a difference here with that? So often people go through challenges and then they're like, okay, thank God I'm past that. And now I don't have to deal with that anymore, mm -hmm. but you really, it spoke to you. So, okay, so you're, you're delivering papers and then you yeah. buy it and you, you decide you have this mission to, to do what? What, what? what at that point? As I said, it wasn't my decision. It was decided that this it is where decided. I have Hashem to be. Hashem said you're doing this. And sometimes people, I think one of the lessons that I'm telling my kids is sometimes you have your own plans, but you have to be modest enough to let Kodesh Baruch Hu to push his own plans as well. Okay, with all due respect, you know, I could do great probably in Torah and scholar and, and, and research, uh, but, and, and, I, and I'm continuing to try to do it, but still you have something, you have some mission in life. And this is where I realized that uh, being in this place is not just to do business, because that wasn't my, my ambitious, is really to see how we can serve the community. And I grew up in a family, my father was a big 
asking someone who yeah, really, I have really heard about him. Yeah. So this is the family I grew up with. Even uh, I mentioned my grand, my grandparents. So my grandfather was the founder of the one of the founders of the oil terrible together with the father-in-law of Herzog and and some Rav Yashiv learned in this school and Rav Vosner, and he was involved with tzedakah and involved. So this is the the the, the house I grew up with. So I asked myself, if I'm here, so the main sense of Mishpacha, which became later, I think, the DNA of our publication, that we are here to serve and to elevate our community. So for me, it was clear always that the, that the real customers are not the advertisers, the real customers are the audience, the readers. And mm. when I had a conflict, when an advertiser came to me and asked me, maybe to play a little bit with the rules, to try to put a hidden uh, uh, advertisement. And I said, uh-uh. And he said, but, but you know, uh, um, your customer is always right. I said, you're right, but my customers are not you. My customers are our people. I, I, I'm just going to interrupt. I, I love that you said that because I, not that we're doing the same thing at all, but I have that same idea where people want to come on this podcast and they say, I'll pay you money. And I say, <laughs> if you're good, and the audience wants to hear you, come for free. And if you have to pay, then I don't want to have you. No yeah, offense. Yeah, same with me. When people are approaching me, you know, I have a great story. Can you help me? And could be even organizations that I am, I am giving them donations. Right, right. I said, if you have a good story to tell, go convince my editors. Don't convince me. Right, right. Don't con- go convince. If they, will, if they will be convinced, you don't have to pay. I, I, not just you don't have to pay. I won't take money right, from you. Right. And I'll give you an example. I was involved in uh, some real estate project in Israel. And when the guy came to me, I thought that the reason why he wanted to be partnering with him because he wanted to use my publication. <laughs> And I told him, I put it very clear on the table, and I brought my marketing manager and one of the editors, and I said, listen, as long as you are not, I'm not a partner, so maybe you have more flexibility once you're a customer that you can do some promotion. Once I am in, you have to know that I have to be much, much more careful that you can put advertisement, you can, but I can't do anything editorially to support the project because I have an obligation for honesty for our readership. People trust us, people see us as their, as their place, and I won't compromise in it. So that, that was some of the value that led me over years. Um, but I say again, the mission was, I felt, as I said, I grew up in a family. My father was fighting for Sephardic girls that wasn't accepted in Ashkenazi seminaries. Shame, big shame, but something that uh, uh, happens, still happens in Israel. He was fighting for kids at risk. He was adopting kids from street and brought them home. He was fighting for Agunot. He was uh, uh, trying to help Haredi with housing, and he decided that Harnov should become a Haredi neighborhood, and he did everything to turn Harnov from a secular neighborhood to be Haredi neighborhood. So if, this is the, the house I grew up. And I felt that this is our mission in the publication, to elevate our society, to be the voice of the people who needed. And I'm telling people, it wasn't like a business plan. I said, this is the best way you can make money. That was my mission. And it's so nice to see that at the end of the day, today we became, I think, the largest uh, Jewish uh, publication internationally, both Hebrew and English. So once you're working under your real values, it's interesting to say that it also works business-wise. And... and uh, to come, especially in Israel, I'm talking about 35 years ago, to come with a publication that you are not political affiliated. You have to know that in Israel, I know in America a little bit used to be, but in Israel, all the traditional newspapers were were political affiliated. Right. So when Aguda wanted to have a voice of Gedoy Israel, they established Hamudia. And when Rav Shach decided that they have to split from the Hasidim and start a new party and a new movement, he started Yated Neeman. And when Arya Deri came and established Shas, he had Yom Leyom and now Haderech. And Belz has their own publication and Chabad have their own publication. So to come and to say, you know, we have a publication, they don't have any affiliation that belongs to everybody. You can have on the cover one week uh, Reb Chaim Kanievsky, another week of Mordechai Eliyahu, and then the Satwa Rebbe giving an interview. That wasn't something that was a given in the Haredi society because we are so, you know, segregated and divided and everyone wants to see the publication that reflects him. So people said, there is no way you can have a publication that don't have any affiliation. Who are you? Are you Litvish? Are you Sephardi? Are you Hasidish? Are you a good or are you? And over the years, at least the beginning, 
it was one of our weaknesses, so-called, because people said, so, so what's your affiliation? Ah, you don't have affiliation, so you are trying just to take advantage and to do business, and uh, ah, mm. you mainly try. And at the beginning, because we were the first Haredi publication who gave respect to the Sephardi community, like we gave the first interview to Rabbi Vadi Yosef who was on the cover, or of Mordechai Eliyahu and other G'doyim. So, ah, so maybe Arya Derry is behind, he made some people deal with your father. People love making drama and ideas and conspiracies. conspiracies. They, people love this so, type so stuff. So I'm telling you, so that was a conspiracy. And in those days, Shas went together with, with the Labour Party, with, with, the, with the Oslo. So it was very easy to say, ah, so maybe Shas has some agenda. So Arya, because how come that you can have a publication and you're Ashkenazic, and you're giving the same space and the same respect to Sephardi society as to Ashkenazi. And it's so nice, again, to see that after years, this mission of becoming very social-oriented, really care about your society, really care about the social challenges in the society, and trying to create a sense of unity. Yes, we can be in the same place. We can disagree in some areas. We can have different different style in education or Torah learning, Torah learning and etc. And still, and still being able to be one big society, I think this, that was a, our mission. And over time became also our business success uh, secret. It's, it's interesting because like right now, like when you think of Mishpacha and think of what you're doing, it's so obvious. But, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, or when you came to America in the early 2000s, it wasn't that obvious. And like you're saying, people had all their conspiracies and all their doubts and, and it's never going to work. What are you doing? How did you, well, did you know that it's going to work or you, or it didn't matter. No, I must admit that I said I didn't went to business school. I didn't. I didn't have any mentor. I started from scratch. I came from the yeshiva hmm. and became. You learned a lot of gemara. That's a very good prep for <laughs> handling arguments and dealing with. No, people but still, in terms of business or in terms right. of understanding. But again, the, I think my my only school was the house I grew up with, which that was like a given that you are treating. My father in the early sixties was in the Peilim. He started the American Peilim with Rebele Shvei and, and Rani Greenwald and others, and he worked with Rav Grossman. So I grew up in a family. My father was was going to the camps, uh, the, the the new immigrant camps, to pick up boys and to bring them to yeshivas. So I grew up in a family that that was the sense. We are here for the mission of Torah. Uh, of uh, ele- elevating the society, but being Sephardi, Ashkenazi, we, we, we lived a few years in Ashdod as part of my father's mission. He went there to build a community as a Peilim. Uh, so we dove in the Sephardi shows with Rabbi Meir Buchatzira. For I, it was never an issue in our family. But people said, but you, you really believe, think that in the Haredi world you can be successful without any affiliation? And over the years, some of our competitors took advantage and sometimes you were u- using this suspicious and came to say, ah, Mishpacha doesn't have an affiliation. Who are the rabbinim behind Mishpacha? And over years, we were facing some waves of attack against Mishpacha and running to rabbinim and coming to rabbinim. We said, what does it mean? You know, Hamodia have, uh, you know, the, the big rebels behind the Yated Neiman, for sure, is the voice of G'doy uh, Israel. Who is Eli Palei? Yudke Palei? What, what, what's going on here? And they went to Rabbanim, and it's you know it's hard to say, but to come with these kind of stories even to Rabbanim, it's very easy because you say, you're not coming to Rabbanim and said, listen, you have to ban Mishpacha. You said we have to encourage people to purchase only publication who really have Gedolim behind, and now that that's the way the campaigns used to work. Hmm. So we went to meet with the Gedolim. My father was very close with Rav Shach and Rav Yoshiv and Rav Vosner, Rav Nisim, and everybody knew him and appreciated him. And once we came and we introduced ourselves, listen, we have Rav Nachem Cohen. It was a time with Rav Shach that he is the head of the rabbinical board. We have serious Rav Moshe Grilak, serious Talmud Chachomim. Rav Moshe was the first editor of Yated Neiman. He was, he was elected by Rav Shach to be the editor, so you, you can't argue. So then we got letters saying, oh, the letter that was published didn't meant Mishpacha because Mishpacha have a vad of Talmud Chachomim. So each time when our competitors were using these campaigns, we got a stronger support from the Gedolim. But, you know, 
But it was like a circle. Every few years was another campaign coming to Rabonim, showing he saw Mishpacha spoke about you know kids abuse. Mishpacha spoke about kids at risk. Why our kids needs to read about these kind of issues? And again, with a tricky way to get letters, not to say that the other publications are kosher, just to say that we have to encourage people to read the kosher, and now we will explain to you what the Gedoyli meant. So it was a challenge. So it was a big challenge. I, I'm sure you still get complaints because that's just the nature of the beast. And when you put out content, people have different views, different ideas, um, and different ways of tackling things. Do you think most of the complaints you get is, is because people... And maybe they're, I don't know if they're jealous of you or they're, they are you know, it's not really coming from a good place or is it coming from a place of, hey, we were really trying to do what's best for our children or Claudius Roll and we have a different approach. Like, which one is it more? It's a very interesting question. And, uh, uh, and I think what, what I learned over time, and this is one of my big lessons, I think the two answers are right. Meaning, the, usually the one who is creating, to use this kind of spins, for sure, it was done by cynical people who knew that it's not true, who knew that Vishpacha is very honest and, and a Torahic publication, etc. And at the end of the day, I think that what Vishpacha is offering, people like, even in, in our diverse society, people are looking for some unity, and this was the voice of Vishpacha. So yeah, it was done by cynical person for business purposes or control or power, whatever. But I'm always telling people, but it's not... You don't make yourself such uh, an excuse and saying, okay, so if someone went to Rabonim, I know who was the people behind. I said, it's not the issue. The fact, and I'm talking about one of the biggest campaigns against Mishpacha was in 2010. This is where Mishpacha, the first time, started to address the issue of the economic challenges of the Haredi society in Israel. We... And that led me later on to our institute that deals today with policy. But Which we'll get to. Yeah. This is where we realize that the issue of draft going to the army or not, and even the issue of kfiyah uh, datit, like opposing uh, Torah lifestyle, they are not the real issues anymore. It used to be an issue. It's not an issue anymore. And we predict that the real issue is going to be the economy or the finance, the economy issue. And I say you don't have to be anti-Haredi at least to ask the question. You know, we respect your lifestyle, and for every, I'm saying for sure us as as, as Haredi people, but even a secular people. I remember the President Rivlin said once. He said, "Listen, we understand that we don't understand you. We understand that you have your own lifestyle and values, but." Can you tell us from your perspective, with these demographic changes that are happening in the state of Israel, how from your perspective you believe, and, and we believe that we need Torah, and without Torah we don't have a future, and this is crucial for the future of the Jewish people, but just from your perspective, okay, now I'm turning it back to you. You tell us, with this demographic growth, with the fact that today every fourth child in the first grade in the education system in Israel is a Haredi boy, how you see it 20 years from now, what's going to happen? And I said, and we as a publication, that was before the Institute, we said, I think we need to address this issue. Meaning, we need to have this dialogue, not to say, okay, we have to change, but at least let's have a real conversation. So we did a survey to see first facts. How many people are working? So first, the women are working at a very high level, and a very high rate. Uh, men's are working, and again, as I mentioned, and the fact that there is maybe, there is maybe more people who wish that they can do some combination of learning and working, but the way that the system in Israel works, they weren't able to do it. So this is what made this mutation that, that to became, became almost illegal, or, or I illegal in terms, not, not the legal way, meaning became illegitimate to go to work. Because that was the way in Israel that you grew up, that if you, you have to choose, it's like, it's binary, it's either you're learning or you're working, but this combination of learning and we said we have to do something. So we did a survey. We did a panel with the Bank of Israel. We, we, we put some, some, some uh, um, we, we spotlight in different areas to see what are the obstacles. If Haredi, let's say Haredi want to go to work, what are the obstacles? Why it doesn't work? And I'll give you an example. In, in Israel, Israel is a very, an academic oriented uh, 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 state. And in most places, if you want to be accepted, even for the public service, you have to have an academic degree. 
why do you have to have the academic degree? Don't ask me, because in many, in many areas it's irrelevant. I'm running a business, and I can, I can recruit people without academic degree and doing a great job and running in the tens of millions of uh, dollars of operation. But you can't be even in the lower level of the government if you don't have an academic degree. So if you, as a want wants to leave the college and to go to work, so okay, first go to, go to a pre-academia, because you have, you have some gaps, mm -hmm. then go for three, four years to do some degree relevant or irrelevant. And again, I'm not against going to academia or college when it's relevant. You'll be, you want to be an accountant, you have to go. You want right. to be a doctor, you have to go. But why if I want to work at the public se service, public sector, I need to have an academic degree. Does it make sense that someone have to spend now five years, four or five years, that you have already to feed a family with three, two, three, four kids, just in order to get the, the key to go to the public sector and to get a poor salary? So, so we, we find out that there is some obstacles. And, and that was the first time like we put it, we, we, made this, we, we made a special supplement just to speak about this issue. It was called Haredim 2010, mistake number one, by <laughs> the way. Why? To, Haredim 2010 already have sounds. a sense of, sounds like, okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what happened right afterwards that people went to our competitors, some of our competitors went to Rabboni and said, ah, Mishpacha is joining our enemies. They are trying to attack the yeshiva system. They are trying to convince, and, and it didn't help that the beginning was an article from Rav Menachem Cohen, the head of the rabbinical board, and saying that our priority, and we are all devoted just to support Torah and to, to make sure whatever we can do to support Torah. Didn't help. At the end of the day, Mishpacha is dealing with economy, meaning they are partnering with Lapid. That was the day's that Lapid was running his campaign against the Haredim. Mm -hmm. And it was really a hard time for us that they delegitimize Mishpacha. And back to your question. So, yes, I knew who were the cynical person behind who made this campaign. I knew exactly what was their motivation. But I said, but you know that these people made this manipulation and you know that it's easy to convince something the Raboni, if they, at least they don't know, until you saw the story about Chaim Kanievsky about this uh, story. So, and again, with this tricky way, not to say that Mishpacha is a problem, to say that we have to encourage, uh, it can work. But I said, but how come the thousands of people buy this story, bought the story? That's the question. Don't hmm. ask the question. Meaning, where, what did you do wrong that people could believe that maybe in these very sensitive days that Lapid is attacking the Torah, maybe the way that you presented this issue wasn't sensitive enough. And this is a tip I, I want to give to people, when, especially if you are in the public uh, sector. Don't try just to blame the outside. Okay, my project failed, or I was trying to do something, so ah, I know because of, no, 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 because of it's one of the reasons, but try to analyze what you can do better. And mm. I think what I learned from this, that we, in, in a way, we weren't sensitive enough to understand that, yes, we did it from a, a sense of mission, a responsibility, and we really want to present our society and the opposite, to show that there is, A, much more people who are working, B, there is some obstacle which doesn't make sense, and, and so on and so on. But still, something in the music, something in the tone wasn't sensitive enough. And that the lesson I took from it, at least if you are working in the field of public, community, and especially in our Torah world, you have to be super, super careful not to do these kind of mistakes because sometimes you can come with great intentions, with very pure intentions, but still causing a damage to the society even without being aware of. It's very admirable that you're taking even things that not aren't necessarily your fault, but if anyone could even glean something negative about it to say, okay, what could I do better next time? So everyone could understand more our mission or what we're trying to do. So something else that, that I'm sure you get asked that about a lot, but I personally don't really know your stance on it, and I'm curious, is, is this idea of having women in the magazine. I'm sure on either end, you're, you know, from people who don't Especially want- Especially here in America, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so like people, you know, on one end, you know, I'm sure a lot of people in Israel like do not want women in the magazine, and you have on the other end, um, maybe people here in America who are like, hey, what, you know, what, whatever the reason is of saying women should be in the magazine, how do you navigate that? Um, it's, a, it's really a tough question. And 
I want to share, I'll give you a scoop. I want to share with you. Sure. When I started the marketing research uh, here in America uh, to come with Mishpacha in English, and that was at the time that I realized that we, if we find the secret, how you can speak to different people in our society, so maybe we can expand this concept and to create like international uh, um, unity between not just Haredim in Israel or from people, Torah observant people around the world, and, and over the years, Baruch Hashem, it worked. My dream was, I said, okay, in Israel, you know, it's a very conservative society, so we can't have, even in the women magazine, we can't have pictures of women. But here in America, for sure, I'll be able to bring a modest pictures of, of uh, Rebetzins or, or experts in the publication. And I started to speak to people. I went to Lakewood, I went to meet with people, and people said, don't dare to do it, don't dare. And I was very disappointed, because it was clear to me that in America it's going to be very easy. They said from a halachic standpoint no, or no, a it's business a, standpoint? It's a business standpoint. Really? So if Mishpacha is all, you, know, you are a newcomer, and you're coming from Israel, and, and, and again, you know that you already have this question mark, who mm. are you, who are the gedolim behind you? Don't try to be metaken oil, don't try to be the one. And I, I must admit, I was very disappointed. Uh, but, you know, I said I have, to, I, have, I have to be sensitive to the market. But in the past few years, it's became a real issue. It's became a real issue because, A, it's very hard to justify why we as a Haredi publication cannot put modest pictures of women. I can explain why we, the Haredi society, are taking this to extreme because you can see what happened in the other world. I was one interview to Iton Haaretz and he asked me this question. He said, well, what's wrong with having pictures? I understand, don't put uh, you know, uh, models or fashion. Right, just, right. Just. And I said to him, he has some magazines on the, on the desk. So do me a favor. Can you open, you pick up each of the magazines you want to pick up and try to show me each, even in one of them, that you can show me a campaign without using women for, from, from very sexual aspect to promote car sales or metrics, metrics and, and, et cetera. And he looked and he said, you know, you're right. Okay, but okay, so don't do it like this. I said, okay, so in, in the argument between us, the Haredim and the non-Haredim, so far, I didn't, I didn't find a place that they know how to keep the balance between giving a respect to, to the women as an equal people and using this with, with some wrong element of using sexuality or mm -hmm. using something, okay. But he said, okay, understand. So I said, so if you want to understand, you ask me to understand, culturally to understand why the Haredi are so fear, I think comes from this because it's a very fine line right, between- Right, it's very hard to balance that. Yeah, okay. But saying that, I think in the past few years it's became a real issue. By the way, it was a real issue way in the in the previous election when it was almost sure that Hillary is right. going. Right, they going were to like ninety nine percent sure she's going to win. Yeah, right. So and we and and we knew that this is going to be a real issue. You know, there was a famous story that uh, I want I want I don't want to mention the name. What one of the Frum publication put a picture after they killed Bin Laden and it was a picture of uh, of the White House and she got blurred sitting, out, right? Yeah, and they blurred out the right. picture of uh, right. so. So, so that was an issue, and Rabbi Avi Nuberger, that is our rabbinical uh, board here in America, started to speak to the Gedolim, the top Poiskim and Gedolim, and ask him what we should do. So first, almost each of them, mainly ask Litvish Poiskim and Litvish Rabbonim, said, he asked, can we put the pictures of Hillary Clinton? And he said, who told you till today that you can't put? Oh, wow. Really? You never, you never... We never told you that, that halachically you're not allowed to do it. Maybe business-wise you decided that you want, I don't know, to satisfy some of your readers, <laughs> but you never asked this question. That was A. And B, they said for sure, if she's going to be the president, it's, it's Shloy Malchus, it's Kvoid Malchus, you have to do it. Right. Okay. The week before the election... But, wait, hold on. At that point, were you, were you, let's say she, in your head, she's going to become president. Were you happy about that? That now you... I guess it's the gateway of having a, a lady. I must admit it, yes. Okay. I said, I said now we have an excuse. Right. Nobody will, will be upset. Once we have an excuse, so we can right. slowly, slowly to try to... That's the behind to you re, telling you. Yeah, and I'm saying, that's, that's all, it. All, all, again, always it was just asking first what, what that story is about. It. Mm -hmm. So yes, I must admit, yes, I was hoping that that will help us to... Okay, the week before the election, so we wanted to taste the water. So we put on the cover like a blurb of 
Trump and Hillary. I don't know if you remember. I don't remember. I don't it wasn't the cover, it but it wasn't a clear picture. Like, ah, okay. like, like, like a blurry blur, Blurish. And we just wanted to see how people would react. So yes, we got some complaints. People called. Was um, it more complaints than you anticipated or less complaints than you anticipated? No. Average. It wasn't dramatic. But got it. Pe okay. yeah, some people got in complaint and we answered the people. Listen, we asked the Gedoyle. This is what we got from the Gedoyle. One of, uh, and again, I won't mention the name, one of the American very yeshiva publication was very upset because he, he understood that once Mishpacha will publish a picture of Hillary Clinton, so everybody will, right, we'll follow. will follow. So so they didn't do it here in America, but they published an editorial in Israel attacking Mishpacha, that Mishpacha is breaking the rules of modesty and Torah, and they meant that we that we put the blurb of Hillary Clinton. Wow. So you already saw that there is some tension and reaction. I remember the day I was here in America, but the day of the election, and we had a conference call with the editors and the rabbinical board. What are we going to do? We are planning to come with a special supplement because I think the election was on Tuesday or Monday, if I'm not mistaken. So the main magazine we closed before, and we decided to do an a special supplement for the for the election with a picture, and we spoke about how we should do it. The idea was uh, that on the front cover we have to put Hillary, but you have to put like a profile. You can put like from the stage mm -hmm. of the, the winning uh, party that right. you can see Hillary, and uh, and in, for sure in the in the in the supplement we will have to put the uh, uh, pictures of Hillary. And, you know, and, and we backed up with with the rabbinical guidance. What I told my editors, it was like. Um, around 12 o'clock here in New York time. I said, we still have 10 hours to pray. <laughs> that Hillary won't want one. And, and, and <laughs> so the wow. miracle, and you see the miracle happened. Could you dive for me? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's pretty powerful. Everyone's yeah. trying to hash <laughs> what it is, the votes, this. It's the Mishpacha team, dominating. that's what it is. See? And, and I, 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 I'm joking because nobody believed during the, 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 the election day, nobody believed that Trump had any Everyone, chance. It, it was clear. It, it was, it was it 100% was clear. Yeah, so we, so we knew that we have to be ready for it. And wow. again, I wasn't upset. But I was joking. I said, listen, we still can daven that we don't have to face this, uh, this challenge. But recently, uh, in the past few years, I had uh, conversations with, uh, with women who care about this issue but not just, for, just from a feministic uh, point of view, which is legitimate, but you know, when people coming to me and say, listen, if you will put pictures of women, so more people will buy. I said, as long as this is a business decision, uh, it's very easy for me because I know my people and I know what I'm losing, what I can gain. That's, that's, let, let, me, let me do my own. But the argument that I heard from people, and I met with uh, uh, Alison Jacob or are you talking about Jew in the City? Yeah, Allison. Uh, I don't remember her last name, but I know her first name is Allison. It could be that's her last name. I'm not sure. Okay. I know her as Jew in, in the City. You're right. Okay, okay, so you met with her. She's uh, great. Yeah, and she and she and again she came to me. Listen, she was one of the people who were running a campaign that you know we should put some pressure on Mishpacha. Oh. We should tell Mishpacha that if we will, uh, uh, you know, we'll have uh, I don't know, uh, two thousand uh, people will sign that we will subscribe to Mishpacha if you will put pictures of women so, and this kind. I said, okay, business. Don't, don't, don't get into my business decision. I'm comfortable. But, but, but when she came and she said, listen, even her, her argument was, we're dealing with Kiruv. We're trying to you know, present our Torah society. And it's really hard for us to explain why you are ignoring women. It's, it, it, you know, we have many issues to deal with about uh, presenting Torah lifestyle. But this is something that we feel very hard to defend. And I want to say that part of the story is also to blame the people who are making it as an issue in the social media because how this lady who is uh, you know, coming to some Shabbaton or a Kiruv seminary knows that this is a real issue because she already saw in the, in the social media. But again, you know, it's, it's a legitimate a debate. But I said, this is really, this is, I, I took this argument back to our editors and listen, this is a real concern because Mishpacha is like the face of the Haredi society. Right. And I heard over the years from so many Balei Tshuva who told me, you have to know that our first steps in, in, in getting into the Torah society was together with your publication. Meaning we were invited to a Frum family for Shabbos, which was a great Shabbos. And we went to a seminary. And then we saw Mishpacha, and Mishpacha was for us like the guidance how the real life looks like. Parenting, 
cooking, uh, um, uh, couplehood issues. So, so part of our you know, contribution to the Kiro world was that we present Haredi uh, uh, lifestyle, Haredi society as is, without covering anything. Sometimes, by the way, part of the crisis with people who came for the tour, they went to the seminaries and they saw like an ideal world that everything is perfect. And then they face reality. Hmm. They face reality as a from people. They face reality sometimes as a ballet shuve, and especially in Israel. I don't, I don't know so much about what's going on here in America. That they're not so well accepted in the society. They're weird. They're, they're they have problems to get their kids into, into a regular chadorim, good chadorim. And today, one of the projects we're dealing with was, is, is about kids at risk. You have to know that the highest percentage of kids of the derech are second generation of Valit Shuva. And it has to do, some of it has to do also with the way that we accept them in our society. Mm-hmm. So when someone, so when we, when we, when, when people, got to introduce to the society through Mishpacha, at least I can, I can say I'm comfortable that we didn't hide anything from them. Yes, we have kids at risk. Yes, we have issues with kids abuse. Yes, we have some issues with divorce and others. Yes, we have some economy challenges. So I was very proud over the years as part of what we accomplished was that Mishpacha, besides just you know, serving the society, also we were partnering with the big mission of trying to bring the Torah, the nice face of Torah to, to the people. And when this argument comes to us, and it, it, it's a real argument, we really feel that we need to do something. It's super complicated. It's super complicated because we live in a time of extremeness. We live in a time that if you are, and, as, and again, as I told you in our history, we always Mishpacha was in a very sensitive position because you, we are not officially affiliated with the Moyetzes and we're not affiliated with any party. Uh, but it's not something that we can't uh, escape, meaning it's an issue, it's on the table. What I did after talking to Allison was we made a decision that in our website, at least, let's start with the website, mm-hmm. we will have presence of women uh, as a Haredi publication uh, have, to, have to be. Um, but it's still something that we have to resolve. I'm just, you know, even in this trip, I met with people, always I'm coming and I want to get feedback. And it's an issue that I think we have to do something. I'm not sure that I have like a clear solution how, but I'm grateful that you're raising this issue because that should be part of the conversation. Meaning our, us as a society need to understand that we need to see the big picture and you need to, part of making a Kiddush Hashem is that you can justify what you're doing. So send me to a radio debate and I can explain why we are much better than the way that the mm-hmm. Western, the secular world is treating women. Absolutely, we are much better. But still, in our own Cheshbon Nefesh, we have to do it. I think we're doing baby steps in this field and hopefully that one day we'll find the right balance. That's a really nice answer for that. And it, it's interesting because you particularly have so many different kinds of people reading Mishpacha, whether they're super, super from and Haredi, or they're like super Modox and modern, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of people that aren't even religious reading mm-hmm. it and mm-hmm. getting more into just an eyesight into what a Jewish home, I guess, mishpacha, really is. It's interesting, in- Yaakov, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. I just got an email yesterday from our women magazine, the Hebrew one, it's called Betocha Mishpacha, In the Family, and she said that her sister is taking a course in the Hebrew University in sociology, and the lecture spoke about some phenomenon and she said she saw in Mishpacha this article. So we're talking about an academic <laughs> world. Right. Uh, and, and, and then another, another uh, student in another course said that her, her, uh, her professor asked them, are you familiar with the phenomenon of Asher Korcho? And she thought like she find a new phenomenon, Asher Korcho. And she was trying to figure out what does it mean Asher Korcho. So she explained, and it was an article in Mishpacha that the headline was Asher Korcho. Ah. About, I think about uh, uh, Haredi men who are struggling between living the Koyla or not. So yes, even people who want really to learn the Haredi society see Mishpacha as something who can really give them like an, um, a way to understand without filters what's really going on in the society. Because I think we are the most honest and courage publication that put things on the table. Even when the Valder story happened, we were the, the only 
Haredi publication who dealt courageously and, and with sadness, with sensitivity, but we felt that it's an issue that we have to address. Right. And that's because we hope to get a, a good like. Right, because like, uh, you know what? You could tell that your mission isn't, it's not about getting the views, getting people to buy more. It's really just about, you know, Claudia Solis has a story and there's things going on and you're just trying to tell that story in the that, that's right way. What, you know, when, when the Waller story happened, I, I lost sleep. I lost sleep. And at the beginning, when I spoke to my editors, at the, starting with the Hebrew, they said, you know, but it's so complicated. And even by the Gedoyle, there is, so why should we step in? I said, this, I said, but this is what we are for. If we are complaining about maybe some Rabbanim, how come that you heard the story and they didn't step in and do something? So what about us? We have responsibility, A, to our society, to our kids, to the safety of our kids, but also... To, as someone presenting the Torah Society, and we owe an answer to our non from society, what we as a Torah Society, how we as a Torah Society are dealing with these kind of issues. And that was really what motivated us to take it very seriously. Um, and I think that we had a big siyat Dishmai to do it right and carefully. I spoke to Big Dayanim to first to learn the field, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I find out that there is so much going on in our society that people weren't aware of. And I went to speak in the public, in, in, the, in, in the television, and usually I'm, especially in this kind of sensitive issue, I'm not volunteering to go to right. speak. But I felt that we have to come with very clear voice about a sense of responsibility. And, and again, what's different between us as Haredi journalist, journalism, as a Torah society, that care, no, no question that we care about the victims and we care about the kids, but we still have dilemmas. And to write in the front page of a secular paper all the details about what exactly happened in such, is that really the way that we want our society to grow up? We just, we just uh, read, read this Shabbos Kedoshim to you. Is we someone who want to have a, a society of Kedusha? So yes, it's necessary that every child and everybody should read. I read the article in Haaretz because I, I, I wanted to understand what's going on. And my wife showed it to me and she, she, she's a psychologist and said, I, I want you to read it. And I read it. And first I said, wow, it's a serious issue. You know, after reading it, I got a sense that, you know, I was close friend with, with the Chaim Valder, but I knew that... Um, I was hoping that it's not right. I was hoping that even if it's right, it was like a one Exaggerated time or two times or uh, accident, right. but not something uh, right. even worse. So that, that was I was hoping. But then I told my kids, this Shabbos, it was Friday. I said, I feel so bad that I read this article because I'm not the same person after reading it. And not just because now I understand what happened, because the way that in our Western world, the Me Too movement, so in order to attack the, the, the predators, so everybody needs to read all the, I would even use the word, no, I won't use the word, but all the dirty details, this is the only way that we can shock us. So is that really the way that us as a Torah society should address these issues? But I said to myself, and again, but we still owe an answer, so what's the alternative? Okay, you're saying that you as a publication, we, are, we, we don't have to, to behave like the, the, the non from publications are behaving, and we, we can't let our society to be exposed to all these dirty details, okay? And so what's your alternative? What are you going to do <laughs> uh, uh, to preserve your community, to take care about the victims? What are you going to do really uh, to make sure that this kind of, of, of uh, uh, tragedies won't, won't happen? So and I'm always living this dilemma, meaning to say that we have a different approach about journalism, with different approach about the way that we're treating women, and et cetera, it's great. But as long as you can come and say, okay, don't just tell me what... We shouldn't do tell me how we as a Torah society are taking the responsibility and of our society and of our kids and coming with a different attitude. And that was the first article we published was in a very sensitive way. I didn't want to attack Haaretz because I said, listen, from their perspective, they did a good job, meaning they find that there is a real, real serious issue. And it's not something that happened one time, it's over years. And so far, nothing happened in the society. So they took the mission to try to shake us and to make us uh, uh, responding to this issue. So I said, I'm not criticizing them. But in a very gentle way, I said, you know, what's our mission as a Torah publication? How on one hand we want to keep a, a safe and pure 
אין ואויר מחנכו קודויש, ואת אוסו ואויר מחנכו תוכויר, ואויר מחנכו סייף. And in this balance, I think this is where משפחה is stepping in, meaning to be relevant, to have a sense of achryos, but to try to show how we as a Torah publication are having different guidance and a different approach to address issues without hiding, without covering, but trying to do it under the Torah values. And this is today the biggest challenge. We'll be right back to the episode with Eli. And I know it's one of my longest episodes I've ever done, but there was so much to talk to him about. I am, I'm blown away. I'm fascinated by him. And I have an interesting story uh, coming up after. Uh, so stick around for that. But first, let me tell you about Yidflix. Yes, that is the most incredible website for from Jews, non-from Jews, non-Jews, whoever it is, you go there and you are enlightened with incredible content made by Jews. And it's, it's, you got stuff for the kids, you got stuff for the adults, you got living L'chaim stuff on there. Um, really incredible stuff. It's, it's like a kosher YouTube, a kosher Netflix, however you want to call it. It's there. Try it out for at least uh, a month. And uh, you could find the link in the show notes, yitflix.com. You'll love them and tell them, hey, Yaakov Linger says hi. And now back to this week's episode. You know, something interesting, I guess we're, we're in a similar type of space, me doing podcasts, you doing publication, and you also do podcasts and a lot of stuff. But, you know, when I started doing podcasts two years ago, I was very concerned to have to interview women because obviously audio, I don't think would have been as much of a hawk, but there's video of this also. And I obviously spoke to the, my Rabbanim and they said I should do it, obviously, with certain guidelines. And I've never gotten one complaint that I've interviewed women. Mm-hmm. Maybe like once or twice, it was like maybe how we did it, maybe a question, but it was never, what are you doing? We're going to cancel you. And I was like <laughs> pleasantly shocked. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. But um, it's interesting. I guess, I guess, you know, society is shifting in a certain way. But w- w- for you, what's the most difficult aspect of dealing with, I guess, the different worlds in the Haredi community and the non-Haredi community? What are the challenges there? Um, I think the two main challenges was, A, as I said, took, took us a very long time to justify that you can be an independent publication and, and even though that we are not under any affiliation with any a political party that usually in Israel political parties are having their muyetzes and you can still do good work in terms of following halacha guidance and rabbinical guidance so that that was something there was a chidush yes you, you you can you can do it but I think that the other challenge is really how to address issues but without creating a negativity and I think this is not from business perspective also I, I'll go back to the story I told you about Allison so I told her, listen, we can, we, can, we can be very courage and start to put pictures of women. Everybody will say, wow, Ishpacha is so courage, you know, they're doing such a good job. But I said, we have a mission, and our mission is to elevate our society. And if by putting these pictures, I will get a lot of likes, maybe. Mm. But we will lose the ability to affect or to influence some segments of the society because they will see us as out of the machane. I think we will lose more than we'll gain, not business-wise. Because I want also people who have maybe different values than me regarding these issues, or maybe they don't have even, maybe the sensitivity to understand why it's important to address this issue in the world that we have such a diversity, but I still have issues of chinuch and kids and couplehood that I want these people to be affected by our work. And this is what, in general, I think that the main challenge that we have is to be uh, with the courage to bring real issues, but not to create by people a sense, ah, you are joining the one who is criticizing our enemies. No, we are doing it from a very sincere and honest way. And I think Baruch Hashem, over the years, we did it very successfully, but it's mainly because really when we're addressing an issue, it's not about how we can get more people to say, ah, finally, Mishpacha is the only one who wrote about Valder. Wow. Kola kavod, applause. No, no, no. We are doing it when we feel that we have to do it. And as I told you, and if we get back a feedback, and we're very, we're listening very carefully to the feedback from the readers, again, not in terms of the business, in terms of our responsibility and mission. 
And it's not a secret. Our society is facing huge issues today. Um, and especially in, in the past few years, and especially after COVID, the issue of uh, youth and kids. There are so many challenges. So to address these issues has to be done in a way that you won't say, hey, ah, it's a norm. Ah, you have, you have a problem with addiction? Yeah, everybody have a problem with addiction. So how this is going to affect the society when something is becoming a norm? And I think one of the sensitivity in Haredi media is not just we want to pretend like we have an ideal society. Because we know, and, and, and we see it by, by also by studies, that when you, when you are speaking to the media about committing suicide, for instance, you can see immediately a wave of people. Why? Because once people who are already struggling see that it happens, so it makes it easier for them to, to go to this field. So how in one, one, one end you want to bring this issue to the, table, to, to the table, but on the other hand you want still to be to keep a sensitivity that it won't become a norm, that you won't hurt people who are not in this field. I don't want everybody to know, or I don't want kids to start to be hysterical about uh, strangers because, you know, we start to tell these kind of stories. And this is where you have to be super, super sensitive. You have to have that story. You have to speak to educators and people and always keeping your, your open ears to see, could be that you had good intentions, but you're missing something. So if you ask me in general, I think this is where the fine line that we are on one way trying to address challenges, but trying not to create a sense of, of um, criticism or, and especially, again, back to Israel, especially in Israel, that the Haredi society is living under a sense of uh, attack and the government, and not just Lieberman, in the past 10 years, it's, it's, it's a real issue. And everything in our lifestyle is under, under criticism and under attack. Some from, you know, as I said, legitimate question. People asking, okay, so you tell us how Israel is going to defend herself in 20 years when every fourth child is going to be Haredi. And you can say it's not our problem because it is our problem, or at least we have to be uh, serious enough to, to come up with answers. And I think we do have some answers. This is where I decided that I have to establish our uh, think tank, the Haredi Institute of Public Affairs, because I said it's not enough to complain. It's not enough to say you don't understand us. Okay, so you come. As I said, the President Rivlin said, so you tell us as you, as leaders who are, Take your responsibility. How are you addressing these issues and coming on one on one end with appreciation and sensitivity to our society and understanding that social changes can affect things that it's not under our control. So you have to do it very carefully. But on the other end, you have to come up with solutions. So dealing with challenges in our kids today, dealing with the big exposure to social media and internet, it's becoming a serious issue. We, um, after a few years that we were doing some studies together with the government in this field, uh, we saw that we need to do something much more uh, proactive, not just to provide the data. Mainly what we are doing in our institute is first to create a data about the Haredi society. And as I mentioned, one of the, of the um, figures is that every four child is a Haredi. Um, in 2065, the, the anticipation is that the third, more than third of the Israeli population is going, are going to be Haredim. But more importantly, between the age of zero to 17, 48% of the total Israeli population, including Arabs, are going to be Haredim. Every second child is going to be Haredi. So that's... Wow. That's 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 really a change. I just I'm like, wow, there's a lot of readers of Mishpacha magazine. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Many years ago, one of my childs was was very young, was brilliant young boy. He came to me and said, Abba, I think you should join with one of the Haredi parties and to create a tshuva movement." And I said, "Why?" He said, it's "Very simple. It's a win-win for the people who became from. You know, they got uh, to to observe mm -hmm. Torah, so 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 they won." For the party, they will get more voters. And for you, we will get more people to buy mishpacha. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, uh, but back to us, I, th I think that today, and if you ask me what's the main challenge. So main challenge is the publication. I said that always to be with the fingers on the pulse 
and not to hide and to be uh, uh, courage enough to bring the real issues, but in a sensitive way, in a constructive way. Again, to criticize is very easy. It's easy to criticize the Haredim. And yes, we have some areas that, that maybe uh, 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 we deserve this kind of criticism. We are doing some mistakes, e even in w when we have good in intentions. I think uh, one of my, main, my concerns in Israel, at least, I said when I grew up as a Haredi boy, we, we grew up with a sense of what we call Kiddush Hashem. When a Haredi boy went to the street, he know, we knew that we have to behave nice because then people will look at us and say, oh, it's a Chilul Hashem. So, and it's not anymore. The way that the Haredi kids is growing up today without any interface with the non-Haredi, he lost any sense of, why do I care about what they think about us? Who? Who is they do they think they were showing? Why do we care about them? And I think this is something that I, I really I feel bad that we're missing, that we have a mission to show how we are raising kids in a different way, how we have a different kind of family values, how we have a different kind of chesed. And, and yes, it's important to show it to our brothers, not, to, not in order to show how oh, we are better than you. No, because we have a responsibility to bring this voice of Torah values to our, to our brothers. Kiruv is something that each and every one of us should care about it. And I think this is what Mishpacha is trying to do. This is what I'm trying to do in our work in the uh, Institute, to try to come and to show that with the, sometimes with a different way of thinking, thinking out of the box, coming with creative models, we can on one hand support our lifestyle, on the other hand, showing that we care about the Israeli economy, we care about the Israeli security, we care about the Israeli uh, welfare system. And I think this, this is today the biggest challenge that we're facing. I think Haredi society is not anymore a small minority. It's not anymore us and them. It's us, the state of Israel, the Jewish peoplehood is our responsibility. And I think it's about time that we should step in the Haredi society, and instead of just uh, complaining about what, why we're, we're not understood, they don't get us well, so we should come and say, no, in an active way, what can we do uh, in this field? And I'll just uh, conclude with uh, some, some of the, 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 the actual challenges we have. I just met a week ago with the chief rabbi of the police in Israel, Rav Rami Brachiau, and a great, a great person, a Talmud Chacham. He's not, he's not Haredi, he's a Kippah Sruga, but a real Talmud Chacham. But beside that, he's focusing on the, the traditional role of a Rav, dealing with halachic challenges of the uh, uh, police uh, uh, area. Um, he, he took upon himself the responsibility the, to create a better relationship between Haredi society and the police in Israel. And especially after the COVID, so when it comes to kids' abuse, when it comes in general to, to safety, um, and he's very, he's meeting with Rabbonim, and he told me that he got a chew from Rabbi Yitzchok Zilberstein about how to preserve Shabbat in, in, in the police. Because, you know, police, unlike the army, but the army is very clear. Shabbat is easy to, to preserve because Shabbat, usually, you're not doing training. So if it's not a war, no problem. So you can keep Shabbat. If it's a war, so pikuach nefesh, police, the day to day is a chilul Shabbos. So can you be on the street? Can you drive with your car just to make sure, not because there is terrorists, just to make sure that their things are under control? This is a real new challenges that the police is facing with. So we, we discussed, so, and, and, and he met with Rebu Weiss, he's meeting with Rabonim. So we, we, we spoke specifically about the issue about kids' safety in Haredi society, what can be done, how we can create better uh, uh, communication between the police and the, the Haredi leaders and institutions and schools and etc. But then he asked me, and, and we spoke about uh, some other ideas, but then he asked me, can you give me some idea what else we can do to create a better trust and a better relationship between Haredim and, non, and, and the, the police? And I told them, the same as we have Atzala and the same as we have Shomrim mm -hmm. uh, and we have Zaka, we should have a huge movement of people who will volunteer uh, and I said, this is a, gr a great way to bring Haredi into. To bring Haredi to be an official police, it's a big challenge. Uh, even technically, with, with all the issues of Shabbat and others. You can bring Haredi more to the administrative work, to be programmers, to be in this field. But 
but to be a real cop, it's a challenge that even non Haredi uh, 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 police are, are facing with. But I said, let's start something like this. And now, after what happened now in El Ad and in Bnei Brak, everybody speaks about it. And I said, when I just uh, landed, I got emails for few, uh, WhatsApp for few people in Israel, big organizations. We have to do something. We have to do something. And I think, again, it's another example of an opportunity. Not just, okay, how can we protect El Ad? How can we make sure that we are stepping in into of the field of, of uh, creating a safe, safe uh, uh, environment, a safe area, in terms of protecting from terrorist attack, in terms of protecting our kids, in terms of stuff. You know that in Haredi cities, over Shabbat, there is a lot of, of crimes that happens because people know that you won't call the police. Right. So right. they will break. So at the end of the day, you have to build a system. And I think this is, if you ask me the future, the system is that we have to learn to live together, meaning Haredi society, by strategy, was starting to build a, a kind of of, of uh, a segregation because this is part of our strategy in this so attempting and, and challenging world in order to kill be able to raise your kids in a sense of Kedusha and a sense of Torah and appreciate values we have to make sure that they are not too much exposed to the big world but on the other end the world exists you have to do something and I think that the way that things has to be done is a balance between on one hand to understand that the way that we build this system in our society is really serving the main purpose of continuing to pass from generation to generation our Torah values and etc. But at the same time, we have to start to face reality and to come with practical solutions. So that's an example. I believe that Yes, we have to take care about our neighborhoods and our cities. Yes, we have to do it with the authorities that they, ha they have the, the experience and the knowledge. And slowly, slowly, we'll be able to build better trust between them. I'm not expecting to see one day that 20% uh, of the police be harassing. But through this process, we will be able to take the sense of volunteering that exists in the Haredi society and to take advantage and say, okay, how we can do the same that we did in, in rescue in Atzala and other organizations, we can do in this field as well. Wow, that's, that's a very um, re revolutionary way of, of looking at it and really very proactive. Um, I have a few questions I want to ask you. Um, I know you have a lot to say on a lot of things, so I want to get to all of them. So I'm first going to say, my first question is like this. Is there a specific issue, story that Mishpacha put out that speaks to you more than the others? I know it's a very hard question. It's like asking like, who, which one of your kids are your favorite? Um, but got to ask it. Um, I think that one of the stories that I'm carrying with me as a, I won't say a turning point, but really express whatever I spoke about Mishpacha, was when the first time, I, I think two stories that has to do with each other. A, the first time that Mishpacha in Hebrew, I'm talking about over 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, we published a short article about uh, uh, kids abuse. It was uh, one of our writers that was on the street and she saw uh, a from father walking with his son and every few steps the son is like uh, shaking. And when they got closer, she saw that he beats his son. Probably they called him to take him back from Cheder. And she was shocked. And when they got to the bus station, she was hoping that he will stop. And then he started to take the kid and to shake him to the wall. And she was shocked. And she called the, the editor. She called her Rav. And she asked, what should I do? And they said, what do you mean? First, call the police. <laughs> First thing, call the police. So we published a two-page uh, article with some illustration. We call it... Uh, a hopeless child, Yelet Chasar Yesha. And we just told the story and what the Rav told her. And we thought, Lit you, little boy, if you are reading us, please call us and we'll try to help you. And that was the first time the Haredi publication spoke about this phenomenon of, uh, of kids' abuse or, or, or violence in, in Haredi society. And right after, um, so we got... Tremendous feedback. It was like the talk of the day. Every family in this Shabbos spoke about it. It was the first time the Haredi publication speaks about it. I was also getting... Even even in the, the non-Haredi world, like, you know, talking about child abuse 20 yeah. years ago was very different than yeah, today. Yeah, it was, it, it was, it was a very, lot more taboo. Yeah. 
And uh, I got also some, someone from the Kirov world was very upset. He said, how dare you to uh, draw such, uh, you know, we are, we are working so hard to show the beautiness of the Torah world and you are taking the dirty uh, um, laundry uh, outside. And he was sure that it was a made up story. It's a make up story because you make it because you want to be popular to show that you are, yeah, you care, you are. And I told him, listen, I don't care about your Chua world. I care about my own society. I, I, can, I can't live in a society that we won't be able to protect this kind of child. And if this hurts your Chua, Chua project or Shabbatonim, too bad. It's not my. It's not my problem. And then right after, and I spoke in the secular media and the radio, and everybody was calling us, "Wow, how dare you?" So, you know, it was a kiddush, a kiddush Hashem kind of uh, story. And when then we decided that you know we have to to get to step in into this field uh, about uh, uh, um, violence in schools between teachers and talking about uh, uh, husbands who are abused husbands. So we, we really decided to do a serial of, of articles about this field. And then our head of the rabbinical board, Rabbi Nachem Cohen, told us, mm -mm. and he said, no. And we were planning to do a real research and in each field to speak to experts. And he said, to, for two reasons, he said, A, the fact that the impact that the, the peace made was because nobody spoke about it before. But if you will make it norm, as I mentioned before, so someone who is struggling with the way that he's behaving with his wife will see that it's not that his problem. You know, every nice person that you think that he's a nice person, Hashu is a raw, is a, he's also treating so that will legitimize to do it better. And that was like his philosophy I mentioned about that we as a Haredi publication have driven the philosophy. But his other point was, and he said, listen, you are dealing with Dine Nefoshes. When you first did it, I felt that it was done L'Shem Shomayim pure. I am afraid that now it's a combination between, A, you care about the story, but also you find it's a good way that you can get likes, as, as mm -hmm. we say today, and I, I think that you can't deal with these issues without being 100% L'Shem Shomayim. Mm -hmm. And this was one of my main lesson. And the other was in the same field was when we first start to speak about kids at risk in Haredi society. It again was an issue that nobody spoke before. I remember when we started the first serial, it was around Pesach time, and we called this boy the fifth child. He said, there is our boy Bonim, there is Russia, yeah, there is a Chacham, Pesach, right. but there is a fifth child. And that like became like a brand name. Not the Russia, I guess? And I say, it's not a Russia, right. not a Chacham. He's like, he's transparent. Like, he's not, a, he's not necessarily a Russia, he's not a Tzaddik, he's not a Chacham. You just don't see him. Mm. And uh, so I think this is where I felt that when we took a very serious issue, and over time we create a change in our society. People start to speak about this. As, as uh, There is some other areas as well, but this is something that I'm taking with me. Sometimes my wife asks me, why always you're getting back to this story? You did since then so many other things. <laughs> but yes, this is that like something that I'm heart. taking with me. Yeah. So I know we spoke about competitors and people complaining, but and I think I kind of know the answer, but... Um, how do you deal with competitors, not necessarily doing, you know, complaining, you know, but just, you know, I, I think there's, I don't think they're near your level, but let's say the Ami magazine or other magazines. Do you operate differently now that you, that now, and I'm sure there's going to be others, uh, other competitors, or that has nothing to do with what you're doing? Um, so, my philosophy, and I'm, I, I really mean it, is A, I'll take you back when I was a very beginner in this field, and I was working at that time still for the the, the original uh, owner publisher, and it was some new publication for women was uh, about to launch, and he asked me and some uh, some someone else who worked for the company if we can maybe do some publicity to say that you know it's like a newcomer, it's a modern way. I said. Uh, you're not talking to the right person. <laughs> I would never hurt someone's business because he's my competitor. For sure, if it's not, even if it's not true. But even if it's true, who gave you the right to halila to hurt someone's business? So, I, I, A, I truly believe that, yes, also we, competition makes the, the market better. So, in, in general, I'm not speaking about a specific publication, I think, and that was we saw over time, yes, always it's good to have uh, competitions in field. It also helps, and I, I see it when, when there is an issue that we are dealing, 
and some other publication are dealing, and then you can tell what what a different approach. Because mm. if you are the only one in the field, so nobody can really appreciate what was unique in the way that you dealt with this. And I think that in our competitors, in many ways, especially, and some sometimes it happened that our competitors were trying to do something very similar uh, to what Mishpacha is doing. And this is where we got the feedback from people. Now we appreciate or understand what you're doing differently. And again, sometimes competitions are, uh, competitors are also doing things uh, uh, even better. So in general, I'm a big believer about uh, the legitimacy of, not the legitimacy, A, a it's right. You know, everybody has the right to, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, uh, to create his own business. But I think it's, if you really want your business to be good, don't try to eliminate competition. Try always to be um, open enough to see what others are doing better. You can do better. What, what do you need to improve in your own system? And again, we're a big community. I think that there is, that there is a need for different voices. I think that Mishpacha over years, I think that that's for the credit of Mishpacha. We like created the style of the Jewish publications. Even in America, when I came to America, uh, to the States, 2004, to, I came 2003, I was shocked to see that everything was so, such old fashioned. Hmm. For, I checked, I said, you know, one of the, of the, as you know, one of the models, the package of Mishpacha, that today became a norm in every pub Jewish publication, that we have, that we have uh, a kids magazine. Hmm. And I was here in America, and the first thing I asked, what do you have here? We came on a weekly basis with a 32 pages uh, uh, kids magazine, colorful with cartoons, and, and we said, they said, what do you, what do you mean? We have Olomeno. Right, I, I remember. We grew up on Olomeno. Yeah. My grandfather grew up on Olomeno. <laughs> said, okay, and <laughs> how, how often Olomeno is coming? They said, I think eight or 10 times a year. Right. Because, uh, during the summer, they're not coming. How many pages? I think maybe 24 or 30, some color, some black and white. And I said, how come? And they asked me, and what's your plan? And I said, I'm planning to come every week with starting with 32 pages. So, how can you? You know, we have the old staff, and I met with the people. We have old staff who is working the entire year, and we're producing eight or ten copies. I said, this is the way, this is the way I'm doing the business. So so I think over over years, Mishpacha set up the standard in Haredi journalism in terms of quality, in terms of the concept that you have to have, the, the, the concept is that it's a family magazine. Now, every if you look around, every publication have a kids magazine, have recipes, a woman magazine. So yes, I'm proud that we affected the, 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 the world to, the, the, the publication world to became better. And I think also we are challenging the publication, especially the conservatives one, with the, 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 the dealing with issues that wasn't acceptable in the Haredi society. I think the difference between Mishpacha and maybe some other, some of the competitors that were doing it with a very big sense of Haredi, it's not a, a, a yellow, uh, in Hebrew we call it itonut sehuba, all, all the gossip, all the, the, these kind of stories. So I won't use this word. I'm saying was, but I'm very proud that uh, uh, we are now, we, we, we don't try uh, uh, to be sensational, we're trying to be uh, uh, respons res with responsibility, with the sensitivity. Yes, sometimes for the short, uh, maybe for the short time, uh, you, you can sell in a specific week uh, in a sensational cover, maybe more papers, but uh, for the long run, I think it doesn't work. And uh, I'm sure you have like a massive team doing mishpacha. Do you still go through the magazine? No. No way. No way. No way. For, for years. Because I, I didn't add this past week in Mishpacha. <laughs> I have No, it's really true. I mean, when this year is, no, no. I'm like, so, maybe he'll see. He'll see. No, no, no. way. No way. First, uh, uh, I remember. There's I so had, much. There's so much. I, every no, week. no. I had, I I had such a conversation, conversation with one of my editors long ago that he was very nitty gritty, you know, uh, hand. He wanted to see everything in, he, in his section. And I was trying to convince him that he have to give some some more space, space to right. his to his deputy editor. I said, but how come? And I said, do you think that the chief editor of the New York Times reads the New York <laughs> Times? Who covers? No way in the right, world. Right. You have to pick up the right people. You have to give them the guidance. You have to give the vision. And you have to make it happen. So uh, it's impossible. Mishpacha today is a huge publication. Hebrew and English, no way. And Shabbos, I have some other 
duties to do over Shabbos. Right. I have to finish the daf. I have to learn Parsha. I have to learn Chumash with my kids. So uh, I'm usually looking just in general to see what's going on, but no do you way. Do you listen to someone in particular's daf or you have a chavrusa? I have a chavrusa. I'm giving a shiur in our office. You give the daf? Yeah, I'm giving really? the daf in Mishpacha office. You should record that. I'm saying that. There you go. An instant <laughs> podcast yeah, right it's, there. It's, it's a challenge. We did it for a few years and then uh, the office moved to another place and my uh, foundation, I was sitting in a different office. So n- now that we turn back to the big office and I'm inviting you next time when you're Thank you. you will. Alive to come and to visit our office. So I'm lucky to have it. So I'm having a chavrosa. I'm, uh, um, I have to prepare for a shiro, So that's a big uh, responsibility. That's a I lot have, of time. I have 30 minutes and we started the shiro by Yavomis. So you can imagine. Wow. What does it mean to take people in the middle of the day work it's a four o'clock uh, shear for 30 minutes, and they're in the middle of... They're busy. They're busy. And they're working and, for and, you. And you, have, and, uh, no, and you have to give them 30 minutes, so the 30 minutes should be very clear and focused. Um, and there is one very popular shear that I'm listening to, but it's only in Hebrew. A guy, his name is Uri, Uri Brilliant. It's called Sinai Dafyumi. That he created... It, originally, it was like 10, 15 minutes... Uh, uh, daf, wow. but the idea wasn't to go over the daf quickly. What he's trying to do is to reorganize the page, what the daf is about. Ah. So we're talking, this is the issue, the issue is break down to two mm-hmm. elements, leave aside the parentheses for a second, now the sugi is going in this direction, and this is his clarity, I never saw something similar, I wish we will have something like this in English. Yeah, we need an English but, version of But then. I'm telling you, it's amazing, even for me, after I'm learning the sugi with the chavrus, and I'm going over and preparing for the shir, usually when he have, not sometimes he skips some dafs, when he have it, I, I, I have to listen because you have such a clarity how to put it. Right, the, the frame, topic? the frame, like what, it's very clever because because the daf or gemara could be in a million places and you don't know what to expect, but if you have that clear frame, then when you actually do it, it's probably a breeze. And to so just sometimes go you it. have like to take 30,000 feet above it. To right. Say, okay, what was the sugya about? By the way, sometimes sugya is four or five pages, but... Sometimes, because we are going into the details, you lose the big picture. So he always takes you back to see the big picture, what the principles of the sugya, what the sugya is about. So yes, that, wow. that's my big uh, privilege. You mentioned before you have a story with Reb Chaim. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? I, I don't uh, think you said it. I don't know if you have time for oh, it. Oh, how? I'll, I'll how tell much, you. I, we're going very long. No, this no, is no, a no. long episode. This is good. Yeah. Um, We're Joe Rogan styling yeah, so, it. So as, so as, uh, as I told you before, each time when we were attacked by uh, competitors who went to Rabonim and got letters and manipulate some of the letters, so what we did, we just went back to the Gedoyli with my father, with the rabbinical board, and asked them, first, tell us, if we're doing something wrong, let us know. We should, for sure, we'll fix it. So I was Barav Yashiv many years ago when the first time uh, the Hasidi was trying to ban Mishpacha, and I went to Rav Yoshev and he asked us, what are their complaints? And by the way, and now I recall, what was the complaint? So Rav Yoshev asked me, what, what did you find wrong in Mishpacha? Because always when someone came to me and said, listen, we have a problem with you, I said, okay, let me know and I'll fix it. What, what's wrong? So they say, at that time, I'm talking about uh, 25 years ago, maybe more. So they say, first they were upset that Mishpacha is putting pictures of girls under the age of three. Oh, wow. In not because they want the girls over the age of three. No, <laughs> I, no, I, they I, I said, know. you know, Mishpacha is not a Haredi publication because what's the problem? That in Family First, in our Hebrew Family First, it's called the uh, Betocha uh, Mishpacha, within the family, we're putting girls under the age of three. So I came together with Rabbi Nachem Cohen and Rabbi Yashif started to laugh. Really? He said, really? He said, mm-hmm. logically, until the age of six, there is no, even the pen, Mishnah Bru and Chazonish, there is no Indian of so to put... Uh, it's a nonsense. And Rabbi Yosha was a very serious person. He, he wasn't smiling so easy. He was like, like laughing. And then he asked what else. And he said they are complaining because you know, in Israel, they're not writing even the name of the writers. The full name. It's the first letter and the family name. Aleph uh, Cohen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Mishpacha was Elisheva Cohen. So they said one of the... the the send us a list of things that we have to change. So they say, you have to, you, you can't put names of women in your publication. And Rav Yashiv looked and said, so he said, understand these people will change the Tanakh also. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm like thinking. That's, that's uh, ridiculous. Uh, they ridiculous. Don't, I don't know how they get through Megillah's Esther, you know. Ridiculous. <laughs> but, but their argument was, listen, we have a standard, meaning we 
in our society, with the girl society, we have a standard, and want mishpacha to accept our standard, and it's good for you, because this way, more people who buy mishpacha, I said, don't do me a favor. <laughs> I am, you have a question, I'm ready to go to ask for a body. So, so each time when something like this happened, we went to ask first, let us know if we're doing something that we have to change, we're the first one to know, and B, wanted to know how, how a rabbinical works, uh, everything before we publish, whether it's an article, an essay, op-ed, or an ad, goes through the rabbinical supervision, so, and if, if there is anything, we are ready to change. So in 2010, when I told you when it was a big campaign, so at some point, they uh, got Rav Nisim Karelitz, and they, they got Rav Nisim in the Pesach issue, we did a cover story about Rav Nisim, after spending like, a week sitting in his basin and sitting in when he meets people and we build a profile and he was on the cover and in one of the Benebra camps they you know before before she Miglik took over at Neman so Reb Nisim was belonged to the wrong camp <laughs> so they were very upset that we gave Reb Nisim this uh, coverage it was like a fight in Benebra so they went to Reb Nisim they were very sophisticated they went to Reb Nisim and ask them that, you know, we need to encourage people not to listen to radio broadcasts that are not from. You know, today it's a big problem with the young kids and also to publications. have to make sure to read only from publications. And for Ibnissim, I know because then I spoke to him, so he was, he had in mind that you mean that he shouldn't read secular newspapers. Nobody mentioned Haredi. So they need only to read good papers. And then they said, so he wrote a letter that they have to keep to read uh, just publication under supervision, but then they said, uh, but people will think because the Rov was interviewed to Mishpacha, that the Rov gave an echshot to Mishpacha, because now the Rov is saying what is not kosher. So the Rov maybe can add that it's including Mishpacha that needs to be under supervision. So he added, and he said, all publications, including Mishpacha, should... so they published the letter of Reb Nisim, and they went to Reb Chaim, and then I came to Reb Chaim with the, one of the big Rabbanim, Rav Silman, and he, got, he understood that it was a mistake, like, he, was, he didn't know that what they're going to do is to use it against Mishpacha. He thought, like, they want just to encourage people to, to be more careful. But they already went to Reb Chaim with the letter without asking Reb Nisim. And automatic, if Reb Nisim signs, Reb Chaim is joining. Well, what's, what's wrong by joining to a letter? He's encouraging people to... So he went to Reb Nisim, and Reb Nisim gave us a letter, and he said that he uh, is asking not to publish his letter against Mishpacha until we'll find out what's going on, because he understood that this is complicated. And uh, he told me, go to Reb Chaim and tell him that, uh, that I asked not to publish the letter. So I went to Reb Chaim, and I said that it was Reb Nisim. And, uh, and I said, I, the Rob was signing the letter, and you know, we feel very bad, and we want to know what we did in the world. So he said, I don't know nothing about you. Reb Nisim asked me to sign, and I signed. Reb Nisim now asked me to freeze it, so I'm freezing. And if Reb Nisim will give you a letter of support, I'll join. I'll give you the letter. It's not, it's not in, in my field. I, I did. And I said, uh, and I said, but I spoke to Reb Nisim. Reb Nisim asked us to tell you that he, he gave us a letter. I showed him, he gave us a letter that he shouldn't publish anything against Mishpacha. So Reb Chaim wasn't uh, naive. <laughs> and he said, it was like... Uh, 11 years ago, and he said, if Rav Nisim wants to send me a message, you know how to send me, meaning he doesn't, <laughs> need, he doesn't need Eli Palay to come to me with a message. So, okay, I went back to Rav, to Rav Nisim. I said, I was for Rav Chaim, and I told him what the Rav told me to tell him. But Rav Chaim said that, uh, if there, he said, first he said, if Rav Nisim asked me to sign, so I said, I never asked him. I never asked him to sign. You know, as I told you, people went <laughs> with the letter to Rav Chaim. Um, and he said, but why didn't you tell him that I told, that I gave you a letter? I told you that I'm asking not to publish anything against Mishpacha till I'll figure out, I'll speak, I'll see what's going on. I said, I did. And Rav Chaim said that, uh, that uh, if Rav Nisi wants to send something, a messenger to him, you know how to do it. So he had a boy who was walking with him every evening. He was like going, um, uh, you know, to make a walk. So he told the guy, please go to Rav Chaim and tell him that I send you a shaliach to tell him. So I called the... Uh, uh, Reb Chaim grandson, and I said I want to come back to Reb Chaim, and Reb Nisim now said, he said, who did he send? He said, he sent uh, uh, the guy who is going with him. His name is, uh, I think, Eisenstadt or something like this. He said, no, come on, you're not sending a message from Reb Nisim by, by the guy who walks with Reb Chaim. Ask Reb Nisim's sons to go with you. He has a son, his name is uh, Shmuel Hillel. 
uh, maybe it's a long story. I don't know. If no, no, it's it. good. I, people <laughs> like stories. I like stories. I want to know where this ends up. So, <laughs> I want to know if Rav Chaim canceled Mishpach or no, not. No. So, uh, so, so the grandson told me, listen, please call Shmuel Hiller, Rav Nisim San. Ask him to speak to his father. And he should come to Rav Chaim, not, not this guy. It's, it's not respectable. Okay? So I called him. We, we know him. We're good friends. And I said, I don't want you to listen to me. Go to your father. Ask your father. And if he will tell you, let's go back to Reb Chaim. Okay, we're waiting till Reb Chaim came back from, Reb Nisim came back from his uh, daily walk. And he spoke to his father. And he said, I asked not to do anything against Mishpacha. I understand that it's complicated, something maybe I was misled. Please go to Reb Chaim. Tell him that I asked to, not to publish anything against Mishpacha. We went back to Reb Chaim. It was nine o'clock already in the evening. We came from the back door. <laughs> they opened the door. Reb Chaim looked at me and said, what are you doing here <laughs> again? Kilo. And uh, and I said, so I came with the, with Reb Nisim Sons and the guy. And the guy said, this is showing the letter. He said, this is Reb Nisim sent me the letter to you. And Reb Chaim's son told, told Reb Chaim that this, is, this guy, Shmuel Hillel, is Reb Nisim's son. And he said, my father sent me to the Rov and asking the Rov not to do anything against Mishpacha. It's a, it's a misunderstanding here. Please don't do. And they said, okay. So I gave Reb Chaim Reb Nisim's letter and I asked if he's ready to add his signature. And his son told me, no need. It, we will take care. But as you hear, Reb Chaim said that we should freeze it. And this is where they stopped the campaign. Later, the people from Yated Neeman was trying to publish against the letter. So it was a very funny story. They got the signature from Nisim, and Reb Chaim is joining him. And then they got Rav Eliashiv to join Reb Chaim and Reb Nisim. But Reb Nisim already canceled his signature. <laughs> so at that, at that time, Reb Nisim has a very big influence on a newspaper called Hamevaser. Hamevaser is a is a competitor of Hamodia in Israel, belongs to Mayor Porush, and the rabbinical board was Reb Nisim's people. So in the same day, the, and the pe- on the other end, the people said, but we have now a signature from Rav Yoshif. But Rav Yoshif was just joining Reb Nisim. Reb Nisim already took back his, his signature. Hmm. So in the same, the same day, Yated Neiman published a letter without the permission of Reb Nisim, against, against his... Uh, Uh-oh, that's not good. ...with the signature of Reb Nisim and Reb Chaim joining, and Rav Yoshif joining him. And Hamevaser took off the signature of Reb Nisim. So it was a letter, an anonymous letter. You don't know who wrote the letter. And then there is a signature of Reb Chaim saying, Gamma Nim Itztarev, but Itztarev to whom? <laughs> so you are joining whom? Well, that was like an interesting story that you saw that, and, and again, I came to Reb Chaim um, really to hear if there is anything he said. I'm not in this business. You know, I, I was just asked if Reb Nisim is signing, I'm, I'm joining Reb Nisim. <laughs> but, Risa, but I didn't ask to join, so. Uh, wow, interesting. And by the way, I never published it. I never, people ask me, did you record? I said, I would record Gedoilin. I came, right. you know, yes, I came to ask, I came to ask a Shaila. I came to make some, uh, 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 to try to explain and to ask. Uh, but it was funny to see that, uh, yes, sometimes you can, uh, in a very manipulative way, to use these kind of campaigns. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, you see where, where Mishpacha is today and where the... Right. Uh, the, the other uh, people who are running campaigns are holding today. So it seems that uh, at the <laughs> end of the day, if you're doing it right, and Hashem Shamayim, and careful, you have the Saturday Shabbat to do it right. So That's really beautiful. So I want to end off with, I guess, your future and Mishpacha's future. So two, two-pronged question. First off, where do you see Mishpacha in 10 years from now? And, and you, I mean, you, you definitely like making a change, you know, I think Mishpacha right now is the vehicle for you, but you know I don't know much about I don't know much about American politics. I definitely don't know much about Israeli politics. Would you ever consider you know running for something there? I don't know if it's Knesset, Prime Minister. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but you definitely have your hand in all the worlds there, and and you definitely understand it, and you definitely are trying to make a change. So those are my two questions for you um, thank you so so regarding mishpacha uh, we're already doing it very strongly in the hebrew i think mishpacha as a leading publication needs to go to the new media uh, uh, again not necessarily to build a website because a website is a very s- simple a very specific vehicle and mishpacha mainly is benefiting from what we provide for people for the weekend but yes, people are having different kind of attention, and that's why when, when we went into the podcast field, so I see Mishpacha becoming much more 
up to date in terms of uh, innovative technology. Also, I have the dream to see Mishpacha becoming the vehicle of the entire Jewish world, meaning uh, I was trying a few years ago to create also a Spanish language but maybe really? that we can do online. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to unite the, 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 Torah, the Torah society. So I believe that probably online, we will, we will bring Mishpacha voice uh, in different languages, and mainly, uh, A, because we want to unite the entire uh, Torah society, and Mishpacha is, is a place, maybe not the only, but almost the only place that people can still sit together and, and having this kind of uh, conversation and learn from each other and, and seeing some models that works in some community and bring it back. But also, as I mentioned, I see part of our role as a Haredi society is really to show how we as a Torah society are dealing with real issues and I think our contribution to show um, the Torah lifestyle is by making it more accessible also to non from people. So I don't see any business model in it, but I see, as you mentioned that you have a lot of audience that they are not from people. I see it part of our mission to bring this voice and the, the, the beautiness and the sincere way that we are facing uh, challenges in our society to the entire world. Um, in terms of my activities, I'm already there. Uh, today, most of my time is devoted to my uh, family foundation and mainly uh, dealing with the think tank that we develop. So we are building, we build over the last six years, a vehicle. I have no any political aspiration. I'm... If yeah, I, you know, have, but this, that's the story of you. You didn't either think Mishpach would be what uh, it is now. Yeah, but I'm, I think I'm in, in, in a stage of life that I can make my choices. So, <laughs> so I'm definitely uh, uh, already influencing the political arena. Uh, we are, uh, uh, our researchers are coming to Knesset committees with data and, and we are working with the uh, big government ministries and providing them data policy strategy regarding different issues of Haredi society. I see it much more effective than running to politics. And again, I have a family, I have any time for Havrusas. I want to find more time to sit and learn. But I believe that we create uh, a platform or a, a place that many challenges of the Haredi society can be dealt through the, the platform that we build in our Haredi Institute, which we have the experts, we have data, we have access to the government, we have access to the big philanthropy that they, uh, in social initiatives, and uh, we got the trust also for rabbinical leadership that yes, there is a serious Haredi entity who deal, deal, deals in respect and responsibility with our challenges. So I would like to be, in 10 years from now, to become irrelevant, meaning that that will become <laughs> the norm in the Haredi society and will be able to, to move on to maybe some other challenges. Wow. Okay. Eli Pale, thank you so much for your time. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Okay, so story time. I got to the people who hosted me for this interview um in manhattan their name is the sharf so first off thank you to the sharfs thank you for letting me use your literal literally dining room to do this interview i got there and i noticed the one thing that every podcaster fears i forgot my memory chips and the sharfs were very hospitable they said don't worry we have memory chips but if you're in the podcast game you know that you need large, large uh, amounts of memory on chips. And I just didn't need one. I had two cameras, uh, my actual pot. I needed multiple chips. And I said, is there like a B&H or I don't know, some store near here? And they're like, yeah, it's uh, there's a PC Richard and Son literally down the block. So I was running. I know that uh, Ellie had another meeting right after. I r literally run there. Um, I actually put on my, my WhatsApp status of like, you're speaking to a high profile person, you don't want to lose your memory chips before. But either way, I got there, I ran back and made it on time. And uh, in the end, uh, I think Ellie's uh, meeting, it, it, it worked out anyways in the end. So the lesson there is, it works out. Don't bug out so much. But uh, yeah, Baruch Hashem, it worked out. And um, I, I literally, I, I mentioned this in the intro, I, I sat there for an hour after um, talking to Ellie about what he's doing. And, and I don't know what I'm allowed to say, what I'm not allowed to say, so I'll just keep it um, parv. But he's working on a few digital projects that is is 
truly incredible for for the world, but particularly Israel. It's it's um what he's working on is is truly fascinating, and I'm blown away by him. And he's he's also you know you meet someone like that. I, I'm always I'm I don't know why I'm always anticipating that people in powerful positions are mean. I don't know why. I don't there's no reason for it. And you know, someone like him is like, wow, he's a really powerful person and he's the biggest mensch. I I I shouldn't be surprised. Um I only heard good things about him, but still I I'm always blown away blown away when there's someone who's doing so much good in the world and is and is such a positive, pleasant, easy to talk to person and and that's exactly who he is and um if you haven't heard of Mishpacha magazine, go pick up a copy or two. I think you you would like it. Uh, go rate us five stars on Apple or, or Spotify. Uh, subscribe to our Living L'chaim YouTube channel and until next time, keep on being inspirational. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.